As we continue on in our study in the book of 1 John, we find a passage, and believe it or not, John mentions God's love again. Of course he would. This is a, one of the themes in the book of 1 John, if not an overriding theme, uh, one, of the, one of the major themes of the book of 1 John. But tonight he brings to us maybe a different aspect, another nuance of the love of God, which I think is quite applicable All right, during this time. I've entitled this sermon, The Perfecting of God's Love. Look in verse 12 of 1 John chapter 4, where the Bible reads, No man hath seen God at any time. Now let me pause there really briefly, or maybe not so briefly. You may read on the news, you may read on a blog, you may see a book that says, I died and went to heaven. 30 seconds in heaven, 30 minutes in heaven, 3 days in heaven. You can know that if they said they saw God, they are lying. And if they're lying, you should reject what they're saying. It's not true. No man hath seen God at any time. If you wonder if they saw God, you don't have to wonder. Well, they said, you know, Brother Howell, it was a wonderful story. They saw a really bright light. And then this nice grandfatherly figure came and he, and he said, you know, go back and live your life. Maybe you've heard about some of these things or maybe, heaven forbid, you've actually read some of them. They can mess up your mind, all right? But it's not true. Because John says, no man has seen God at any time. He said, I, I don't know of any plainer way he could have said this. Remember, John often makes things very plain for us, very clear. This is one of those statements, all right? So don't wonder. Somebody said they died and they had an afterlife vision. They didn't. They didn't. Is it appointed unto man once to die? All right, now, are there exceptions? Yes, Lazarus. All right, he was really dead. He was really dead. But as far as I know, those people were never revived by the Son of God. Those other people nowadays, all right? In case you're wondering, no man has seen God at any time. Good. We can now move on. Any questions? All right, just read it again. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and delivered the love of God hath, that, God, that God hath to us. O God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. See, verse 12, he said, his love is perfected in us. And now here in verse 17, we have kind of the completion and another thought of that. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but, this is word again, perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect. And love. See how I got that title, The Perfecting of God's Love? Didn't take a rocket scientist. Four times in these verses, uh, a portion of that word or the word, a form of that word is used. Perfecting of God's love in your life and in my life. Lord, I'd ask you to help us in the next few moments. It would help us as we look at your word to hear from your spirit and your word in our hearts. Lord, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, I pray you'd help us as we look at your word that you would touch us Make us mark your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We have this next Sunday, man, write it down, Mother's Day. This is your friendly reminder. Reminder: Not today, not tomorrow, not Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but next Sunday. All right, I believe we're going to launch some things from the church. They'll be a help to you. And I, I don't think they've been launched yet. As they come out, I think you'll enjoy them. They'll be a blessing to you along the way. But as you get ready for Mother's Day, there's a few things men you have to remember. All right, number one, your wives or mothers. And I don't know why for Mother's Day you cook for your wives, but I don't know. It's a, I don't get into that thing. But, but you do, right? Men, you have to, for Mother's Day, cook for the wives, I guess, because they're the mothers or something like that. But, but I, will, I will do that same thing. And I know, if you are here, you hear my wife say amen really loudly, actually. And uh, I, I will cook one thing. I, 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 I've asked her, we talked about a little bit. She's not telling me exactly what she wanted. But I can imagine her breakfast food will be this, crepes. She loves, loves, loves crepes. First time I had crepes was actually with my wife. I had not been introduced before to crepes. She was not my wife at that time. I went out to visit her in New Jersey. 
We were just young people then, not as, you know, I'm old now, but young back then, just children really. And um, she was going to make me breakfast these crepes. She just loves crepes. And I watched her make the crepes. I will not tell you how they turned out because that's not part of the story and it would not be <laughs> beneficial to Mother's Day coming up. But I'm going to make, I probably will make crepes this Sunday. I've not, I not, I figure that's what she'll ask me to make for breakfast. She's shaking her head, her head yes, so that, that's the plan. Now, to make crepes, a couple of things you have to know about crepes. Number one, you have to make the batter the day before. All right, if you don't, they will not turn out okay. You have to use a pan that's heated to the exact right temperature. If not, they will not turn out the right way. You have to use real butter. You can't use anything fake in crepes. And, above all, you have to throw away the first one you make. I don't know why this is a rule, but it is the rule, all right, given to us, passed down through the ages. When you make crepes, you make a very thin batter, you pour it in the pan, and then it has to cook until it becomes perfection. If it's overdone and burnt, my wife will not eat, nor should she, that crepe. If it's underdone, all right, it's a little bit chewy and gooey and quite frankly disgusting. There is like this perfect temperature. Crepes are not like pancakes. I make pancakes for my kids sometimes on Saturdays. And pancakes, you can mix the batter whenever, however, and do whatever. You can have the pan or the griddle or basically the hot cement, whatever, and you can throw the batter on there and in about two or three minutes flip it with anything, a spatula, a shoe, a flip-flop. Flip it, put it on a plate, and you got a pancake, right? They don't all turn out like Cracker Barrel's pancakes, which those were delicious. That was one thing I missed since going on the keto diet was Cracker Barrel pancakes. But pancakes, it doesn't really matter. You can flop them all over the place, throw them all around and do whatever with the batter. It doesn't really matter how it turns out. But crepes, no, they have to be handled with care. So they come out complete. And so they come out fully formed, fully baked, or, if I can, perfect. You see, God wants us in our life, in your life, in my life, to make us perfectly complete. Perfect in its entirety, perfectly formed, perfectly fashioned in His likeness. And He uses, this passage tells us, His love to do it. And His love has a perfecting, a completing quality in your life and in my life. I'm so thankful that God is the one doing the human baking here. Have you ever seen a straight river? Canals are straight. Canals are human form, but it seems that all rivers seem to be crooked. We, we, we say that they're meandering. They, they often have the natural tendency to take the easiest way around an obstacle. You'll see a river go around a little rock, or a tree, or an indentation in, in, in the earth. You see, rivers are crooked and they always run downhill. And some people are like rivers, they're too lazy and immature to run a straight path. But God's love wants you and I to be complete. It wants us to have a straight path, right, in perfection. Well, what does that perfect love look like in a life? When God's love becomes perfected or complete in my life and your life, what does it look like? And John answers the question for us. Isn't that good? He tells us what it looks like. You know, we could say if we didn't have the Bible, we could say, well, it would have a nice feeling toward everybody. I think you ought to have nice feelings toward everybody. That's not exactly what John says. You say, well, it ought to be accepting of everybody's ideas. That's what others would have us to believe love is. All right, that if I love you, then you can operate however you want to, make any decision you want to, live however you want to, and I say it's okay, therefore I love you. But John does not tell us that's what love is. He tells us, I believe, three statements about love or, or reminders about love. The first one is a reminder to love. When God's love is perfected in my life, just to remind us, we will love one another. It's a reminder of the presumption to love. It's expected that if we have God's love, we will love someone else. When God's love becomes perfected in my life, I will begin to love one another. We spent a lot of time on this last couple of weeks. I will not hit those sermons again. If you have a problem r loving another Christian, read First John again and listen to the sermons. It'll make it clear and plain. He reminds us to love one another. But he also reminds us, in this passage, of the privilege of the Spirit. Look at verse 13, if you would. 
where he says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Remember in 1 John chapter 2, John tells us that we have an unction from the Holy One, an unction to function. God's love is demonstrated by the power of the Spirit in my life. Because of God's love, I have the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of me, who enables me to live for Him. We looked at Daniel this morning and his excellent spirit. I think it was partly how he carried himself, but also the power of God on his life. You and I have the power of God through the Holy Spirit on our life. And if we walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, then God's love becomes perfected in us. It's also a reminder of the provision of the Father. Verse 14, John tells us, to remind us that God sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Don't ever, don't ever get accustomed or grow tired of hearing about the gospel. Don't ever get tired of hearing about how God sent His Son Jesus to be the Savior of the world. The, the, it, throughout First John, though he talks about God's love, it is almost always linked back to God's gift of His Son Jesus Christ. No accident, all right, that, that John continually brings back this aspect because as Christians, if we're not careful, we, we move on from the gospel. We hear the gospel, we share the gospel, but then we carry on with our lives and forget the gospel. Don't forget that John also wrote that little verse, John three sixteen. Probably, the, if not the most familiar, one of the most familiar verses in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Don't forget that we have been reminded of the provision of the Father. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I can now live a holy, sanctified life. This love began with God. God is love. We love Him because He first loved us. There's a reminder in here in our perfecting of love of what God has done. The Spirit and the Son. But there's also in this passage in verse 17 a realization in labor. Herein is our love made perfect, verse 17 says, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Well, we know that we will not stand before God in judgment as unsaved people if we've trusted Christ. This book is written to, to Christians, to those who are saved. That's why John uses the word beloved, beloved, and beloved. He's talking to people he loves, and it's a salvation, a Christian term in that. But we must give an account for what we've done. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, young people, this year, school ended a little bit earlier than normal. Now, seniors, I feel for you. If you're listening tonight, know that my heart goes out to you. I'm trying to work out some things for you, um, for the seniors. I feel for all the students, but for the, for the seniors especially in your senior year. All right, year you look forward to pretty much since early on. You see the big, bad seniors in the school. Ninth and 10th grade, like, oh, seniors, 11th grade, wow. My senior year, now you're seniors. As seniors, you've had a lot of finals, a lot of exams in life, a lot of tests in life. Seniors, some, and I've had you in my class, some you are ready for and some you weren't ready for. I've been guilty of that as well. Sometimes I've been ready for a test, sometimes not so ready for a test. You see, John reminds us that we have a judgment, that we answer to God, to Christ, for the things done in my body. And he says, when the love is perfected, he can enter that judgment, the time of judgment, with boldness, not with fear. Because we're giving an account to Jesus, but I don't have to be afraid of that account. There are times in my life that I've made poor decisions and then had to answer to authority for those poor decisions. I never felt good about that. I never thought, wow, this is wonderful. In a little illustration, if you've ever been pulled over and you were actually speeding, then you have to answer to authority for a thing done in the body. You normally don't feel good about it. I'd been pulled over for unknown reasons and I didn't worry about those, now did I? 
I told you before, but a couple of years ago now, maybe a year and a half ago now, I was driving after a men's prayer meeting. I called someone in the hospital. I drove over there right in that time frame. I'm going down in my little gray truck. I got pulled over by a police officer. As he came up, he was rather grumpy. He was in a uh, boy close to downtown Saginaw about that time. He said, why? He asked where I was going so fast. And I said, well, officer, I wasn't. He said, no, you're going 70 through the light. Now, I wasn't going 70 through the light, not even close to 70. Then it hit me that he had seen another truck that had gone past me that was also gray and silver in color. And I said, oh, I said, oh, you mean, I said that, I think I said, I think I said it was a Chevy Silverado, a 1500 that went past me. The thing was flying by. Ugh. Very grumpy, very angry, went back to his vehicle. In the second I saw behind, I had not seen before, behind him a, another vehicle, another police officer vehicle, state police, pull out from behind him and pull away. So that was weird. There are two back there. And then right after that, I saw another uh, a BV vehicle pull out from behind that. There were apparently three cars behind me. Just my little truck, my, my little old guy, just me, just sitting there minding my own business. He came back and grumbled that, yes, there was indeed another truck out there that was not my truck. And I think he was kind of angry. He couldn't give me a ticket for what I wasn't doing. But at that time, I was not afraid. I didn't have any fear in my, in my gut. Perfect love cast out fear. I, I knew I was fine. I hadn't done anything wrong. Anything wrong. But there's been other times <laughs> when you see that police officer and your eyes rip down to the dashboard. <gasps> did he catch me? Did he? What, did, you know, oh, and then you go by and he's, and he's not looking your direction. Like, wow. You know, look at that. I was going too over and he didn't catch me. Perfect love cast out this fear. Here in our love made perfect. We may have boldness in the day. In college, I had the privilege of having history of civilization from a man named Dr. Edward Panosian. My parents also took history of civilization from him. Pastor, did you have him as well? He had him as well, so he was even older than I am. Now, going into it, my parents had said, oh, you're going to love Dr. Panosian. Everyone needs to take this guy in school. And I should have known then that he'd be tough, and he was very, very tough. I found out there are students that would take summer school, other classes, just to not have him because he was so tough. He started every class with a, with a quiz, take out a half sheet of paper, he would say. If it's your birthday, write your name at the top and pass the paper in. Every test, he would say these words. I will, don't think I'll ever forget them. He said, this too shall pass, and so shall most of you. And he was right. This too passed, and so did most of us. I passed, but, but some people took summer classes just to avoid it. There was a fear, not a boldness, in the day of judgment of his class. See, I've had lots of tests, and sometimes I studied, and sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I prepared, and sometimes I didn't. And I reaped the reward of that in those classes. But understand something, that we will, we will give an account before the Lord. And because of his love, we can have boldness. Amen. See, that verse is not one to make us fear. It is to make us rejoice because of God's love. When Christ come back, Christ who is our life, it is not, uh-oh, what will he do? You see, sometimes we get that idea that it's like a parent coming back who's going to discipline the children and, hey, watch out, Jesus is watching you. And he is. And he is. He will give a reward and, and things done in the flesh will not gain that reward. But it is not a verse with God's love for fear, but for boldness. Because I serve a living Savior, a risen Savior, who is coming back again. And when he comes back, he'll bring, the Bible says, his reward with him. Amen. You see, when God's love is perfected in my life, now I don't live in fear. I live in confidence. Amen. Instead of fear, I have faith. And confidence is Christ-likeness. Confidence not in what I do, but in who he is. Amen. That is love. God's love in my life wants to bring a confidence Sometimes people will say, well, you're just a list of do's and don'ts. Now, read your Bible. God gives us a lot of things to do and not to do. All right, kind of like a list of do's and don'ts. But that's not why we live or how we live. I don't get up in the morning and say, okay, I better read my Bible, check the box. I better say, I love you to my wife, check the box. God's not looking for robots. But this is not also not a free reign on earth. 
All right, Paul said that. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God cares how I live. But I can have confidence because of God's love for me, knowing that his son Jesus was given for me and will let me stand before him, not in my own righteousness, but in his righteousness. Confidence not in what I will do or say, but in who he is and what Jesus did for me. Sometimes people ask this question, well, Pastor, I'm nervous about my salvation. Because there's that passage in Matthew where, where Jesus said, well, many will say that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in your name and done many things? I'm loosely paraphrasing it. And Jesus responds, depart from me, ye works of iniquity, I never knew you. Right? And, and there's, some have said to me, well, Pastor, I'm nervous because I don't know if I'm saved. I don't want to be like cast out of the presence of, of, of Christ. I think the key is in that passage of what they said and what Jesus said. See, when they came before God, they did not say, your son, Jesus, your payment for my sin. They said, have we not? Look what I have done. We've cast out devils in your name, all right? Look what we've done, so let me into heaven based on what I've done, and that won't get anyone into heaven. Nothing I can do will earn my way to heaven. Only my faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross for my sin. If you've never trusted Christ, would you trust him tonight? Trust that God loves you so much, loved me so much, that he sent his son Jesus to be the savior, that verse says, of the world. We can have confidence when he comes, not because of anything you or I do, but because of Jesus and his blood. See, there's a, there's a reminder to love. There's a realization of labor. But then lastly, there's a resolution in life. Verse 18, if we could, there is no fear in love. I remember when Pastor preached a message, series of messages on fear. I preached on fear. Tonight I'll mention it again tonight. Fear, the greatest travesty of life. Fear, the greatest travesty of life. Fear distorts life. Fear misrepresents life. And the Bible says that if there's fear, then God's love is not made perfect in my life. That's what he says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. But I've, for my kids, said it this way, don't let fear control you. There will always be occasion for fear in our lives. Financial fear, health fear, fear of the unknown. Misophobia, fear of the dirt. Hydrophobia, fear of water. Nyclophobia, fear of darkness. Acrophobia, fear of high places. Taxophobia, fear of being buried alive. <laughs> Xenophobia, fear of strangers. I don't know if I can say this word right. I won't mis mispronounce this one, but triskidekaphophobia, fear of the number 13. Fear of the number 13. But unfortunately, many people have learned to fear things that are not of God. Right. Perfect love casteth out fear. See, fear makes things appear to be the Great Wall of China. There's a myth out there that says you can see the Great Wall of China from space. So large, such a human accomplishment that you can see this from the moon. But someone put it this way, to see the great wall from the moon would be the same as seeing a human hair viewed from two miles away. That's what fear does though, isn't it? Doesn't it? It takes something that is in perspective, a human hair from two miles away and makes it appear to be insurmountable. That's what fear does in our life. There will always be occasion for fear in my life and your life. But God's love is greater than my fear. God's love is bigger than my fear. God's love is greater than any problem. Because God loves me, nothing can stop Him from loving me. Because it's God. His love is greater than anything else. Because God loves me, nothing can stop Him from loving me. I love my kids. I love them a whole bunch. I can't imagine 
something stopping my love for my children. I can't imagine it. I couldn't imagine what that would be. I would have to admit that it's probably humanly possible because the Bible acknowledges there are some things that are humanly possible that I don't like to acknowledge or admit. But my love for my kids, which I believe is vast and immense and deep, is only the smallest drop in the largest bucket in comparison to God's love for me and for you. You may have some fear in your life. Now I'll come back to this one. Because there's always occasion for fear in our life. Right now we're living in a fearful time. People afraid of everything. Everything. My Bible says that perfect love casteth out fear. That doesn't mean I live foolishly. That means I live by faith, not by sight. Sight says I see the Great Wall of China in front of me. I can't get around it. It's too big. It's too thick. It's going to crumble on top of me. And God's love says, is that a human hair two miles away? I can't even see it from my spot up here. See, perfect love casts out fear. A young girl was unaccustomed to traveling, was taking a train ride to the country. She had a fear of water. And it happened on the course of that trip, particular trip, that this train was going to pass three or more rivers. She came up to the first river, as the story goes. She saw the water begin to tremble, being afraid, but as she, they got very close, she saw the bridge. The train passed safely over the river, continued on the journey. A little while later, the train, as the story goes, came across another river. She saw the river from afar and, and again began to tremble, began to shake, and began to have fear because of her fear of water. And again, as they came close to the river, again there was a bridge and she traveled safely. The train traveled safely over, over the river. The third time, the experience was repeated. But after that third time, a fellow passenger observed this little girl leaned back, breathed, breathed a long breath of relief and confidence, and said this, well, look at that. Somebody has put bridges along the entire trip. <laughs> well, look at that. Somebody has put bridges along the entire trip. Perfect love casteth out fear. You afraid tonight? If you're afraid, God's love has not done its perfecting work yet in your life. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to rest in your love. Lord, there are always occasions for fear in my life and lives of those around me, people, Lord. And what I fear may not be with someone else's fears. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to rest in your love. You're such a good God. Your love is so vast, so immense, that we don't have to fear anything because nothing can stop me or your love from loving me. Lord, help us, to be honest, to rest in your love. I wonder tonight, whether you're here or at home, I wonder if the Lord touched your heart. I wonder if God's love has been allowed to finish its perfecting work in your life. Are you afraid? Are you living in fear? Is that huge wall of China in front of you? But from God's perspective, just a little human hair? Would you let his love do a perfecting work? Perfect love casted out fear. You don't have to be afraid because God's in control. He loves you and nothing can stop that. God's touched your heart. You can bend a knee at home or here. Allow his love to touch your heart. Rest in his love by faith. My friend, maybe you listen tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. God loves you so much. He sent us on Jesus to die for you. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven. The only thing we can do is by faith accept the gift of heaven. For the wages of sin is death and separation from God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has a gift for you, He's a gift for me, and it's life in heaven forever. And that gift is only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God.
God sent his son to be the savior of the world, you can trust him today. You can be maybe at home or in your car and your lazy boy or out on the deck. And you can pray right where you're at and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ, would you pray that tonight? Would you believe that tonight? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, if you've never trusted Christ, you can trust in the night and he will save you. And promise you a home in heaven, eternal life. Would you trust him? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me was buried and rose in the third day. Please say, I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you prayed that and meant that, the Bible says that he did save you. Would you do me a favor if you did that? If you've never trusted Christ before, but if you prayed that just now and you meant that from your heart, would you jot me a note or leave me a message? On your screen, there'll be a phone number and a website and email address. Just throw me a quick note or leave me a quick message. Pastor, I prayed that. I'd love to send you a free book. Help you in your walk as a Christian. Your growth as a Christian. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. May we walk in that love. In faith, not in fear. In Jesus' name, amen.